Three weeks ago, we introduced a new vision to our church to be a gospel-centered church that equips culture-shaping Christians in our attempt to understand how the gospel is the message that informs our ministry and informs our lives and informs our identity and informs how one is to be saved. But that doesn't end there. The gospel then empowers us and moves us. That good news that God saves sinners through Jesus Christ then empowers us and moves us to shape culture for the glory of God and for the glory of the kingdom. And we've been working through a series called Kingdom Come God's calling to his people. And we've been looking at various stories in the book of Acts of how the early church responded. If you remember a few weeks ago when we introduced this new vision and we looked at the beginning of Acts, we find in Acts chapter one a resurrected Jesus who's ready to go to heaven but not before he gives the calling to his people. And he tells them this, that I'm going to heaven, but you're staying here. As much as you would love to come with me, I'm keeping you here. And the reason I'm keeping you here is because I want you to be my agents of hope and restoration and redemption and reconciliation in a lost and dying world. And we see in Acts chapter one and Acts chapter two, how the church responded. And we're gonna continue to look at the book of Acts by skipping forward to Acts chapter 17. Because it's in Acts chapter chapter 17 that we see Paul on his second missionary journey. The apostle Paul took three missionary journeys. And it's in Acts chapter 17 that we find him in the midst of his second missionary journey. And it's in his second missionary journey that he is in, of all places, Athens. The cultural and intellectual capital of the world is where we find Paul living out his calling to be an agent of renewal and redemption in a lost and dying world. So let's look together at Acts chapter 17, verses 16 through 21. Hear the word of God. Now, while Paul was waiting for them at Athens, his spirit was provoked within him as he saw that the city was full of idols. So he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and with the devout persons and in the marketplace every day with those who happened to be there. Some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers also conversed with him. And some said, what does this babbler wish to say? Others said, He seems to be a preacher of foreign divinities because he was preaching Jesus and the resurrection. And they took him and brought him to the Areopagus saying, may we know what this new teaching is that you're presenting. For you bring some strange things to our ears. We wish to know therefore what these things mean. Now all the Athenians and all the foreigners who live there would spend their time in nothing except telling or hearing something new. And the grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our Lord, it stands forever. Amen. Religion is fine, just keep it to yourself. Religion is fine, just keep it to yourself. It's great that you believe in Jesus, but that's between you and Jesus and should have nothing to do with my life. You see, we earlier in our service said what is called the Apostles' Creed, but that, what I just said, could very well be the cultural creed of our day. Religion is fine, just keep it to yourself. I'm sure you've heard that or some semblance of that in your life at some point. It is the motto, it is the creed of our current culture. Religion is fine, just keep it to yourself. But what's interesting is, as we begin to unpack what the early church did with the message of Jesus Christ, specifically what we see here in the passage that we just read in Acts chapter 17, we have to ask the question, was this a people, was this a man by the name of Paul, who said, religion is fine for me, I'll just keep it to myself? Hardly not. What we see here in Acts chapter 17 is that we see that his faith was on the one hand deeply personal. Nobody could argue that. But on the other hand, it was profoundly public. Deeply personal, 
but profoundly public. There was nothing private about Paul's faith. There was nothing private about Paul's Jesus. You see, often we think of Christianity like this. It's just Jesus and me. And Jesus and Christianity simply fits into my already crowded and busy life and schedule. Jesus comes into my life and personally helps me achieve the goals and agendas of my already purposed and planned life. But what we see from the early church and what we see from the Apostle Paul is far from what I just described. You see, when Paul embraces Jesus as his personal Lord and Savior, he does not say, Jesus now fits into my agenda. Paul says, Jesus now becomes my agenda. Christianity doesn't just fit into my agenda. The message of Christ and him crucified now becomes my agenda that drives my life and drives my mission and drives my purpose. And so Paul's encounter in Athens gives us an incredible picture of what a deeply personal relationship with Jesus looks like as it's brought to the culture of our day. Three questions I want to answer this morning. Where did Paul go? What did he do? And why was he so effective? The first question to understand this personal but public faith of Paul, we have to understand where exactly was he? Where did he go? It says at first in the passage that we just read that he was talking to the uh, devout and to the religious. But eventually in verse 17, we're told that he goes into the marketplace And it's in the marketplace that he brings Christ. It's in the marketplace that he brings his faith. Now, you might be thinking, Paul was walking around Target? That seems a little creepy. I mean, was he walking around the Coral Ridge Mall or Publix, the marketplace? I mean, what's so effective about that ministry? Well, that's not exactly what marketplace means here in Acts chapter 17. You see, our understanding of marketplace is far from the marketplace in the ancient day. You see, in in the ancient times in the Roman Empire, there was no technology, there was no media, so everybody was drawn to a central location in the great cities of the world at the time, and it was called the marketplace. The marketplace was not just the shopping mall, the marketplace was where the judges met and deliberated. It's where the politicians gathered to talk about new laws and new policies. It's where the business professionals gathered and traded commerce. It's where the artists came and created new art. It's where the philosophers congregated to debate and philosophize over new ideas and new concepts and new religion. This is where things happened. This is where life happened. It was the center of culture, the marketplace. It was the public square where ideas and art and business and politics and philosophy all convened and the people of the day It was as if somebody would, it was as if Paul was going out to Hollywood and walking around the the movie studios and television studios talking about his faith and talking about Christianity. It was as if Paul was going up to Washington, D.C. and walking the the Capitol, how I wish he was, going around the Capitol and, and talking about Jesus Christ and him crucified. It would be as if Paul was going throughout Wall Street and going to the New York Stock Exchange and talking about Jesus. This is what it meant for Paul to go to the marketplace. So hardly an example of a man keeping his faith private. Paul went right into the center of it all, to the center of culture, to the center of what we would call the public square of ideas, business, art, philosophy, and religion, and brought the mind of Christ to those that were shaping culture. You see, we cannot be a culture-shaping church and culture-shaping Christians unless we are willing to go where culture is actually being shaped. Does that make sense? You see, when we see Paul here taking Jesus right into the midst of the action, right into the midst of the public square and into the marketplace, this is not narrow-mindedness. This is logical. You see, if Paul's God was the creator of all things, if Paul's Jesus was truly Lord of all, if Jesus was Lord of politics and culture and society and art and media and business, if Jesus was truly Lord of all, it's only logical, it's only consistent that Paul would bring Jesus into the marketplace. Does that make sense? He's being consistent. 
He's being logical. Paul's Jesus is not just Lord of his personal life, but he's Lord of everything. And tomorrow morning, when you get up out of the bed, wherever God has put you in life, whether you're in high school or in college, retiree, in the marketplace, in politics, in media, wherever God has placed you, God is calling you to live a life, yes, personally devoted to Jesus, but with a deep public expression to the culture and to a lost and dying world. Our faith is supposed to affect every aspect of our life and of your lives in the public square and in our culture. So very important to see where Paul went right into the heart of it all. But not only is it important for us to see where he went, it's important to see what did he do? Once he got there, what exactly did he do? Well, in verse 17, he says that he began to reason. He began to present the objective truth about Christianity. We might call this today apologetics, where he was reasoning with with the devout religious leaders of the day. He was presenting to them the objective truths of Christianity. But he didn't stop there. You see, Paul just didn't turn this into a debate. He just didn't present them facts. This is why. It says in verse 18 that some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers were there. Why would Luke, in writing Acts, include this? What's an Epicurean and what's a Stoic? It's a great question. The Epicureans, was a, it was a philosophy that believed this, that man's chief goal in life was self-pleasure without any suffering or pain. That's what the Epicureans believed. I don't think we're too far off today in our culture. A life full of self-pleasure, absent and void of any suffering or pain. The Stoics, on the other hand, they believed in finding that the chief end of your life was to gain total control and total sovereignty over your life, where you ultimately became the god of your life. Once again, doesn't sound too far off from our culture today. And so what Paul was doing, he was, he was going toe to toe and head to head with people that were saying, our chief end in life, our most important purpose in life is our self-pleasure. And then he was going toe to toe and head to head with another group of people that's saying, no, our chief end, our chief purpose in life is to gain total control over our lives so that we ultimately become God. And so it wasn't enough just for Paul to present the facts. What does he do? It says in verse 18 that they said, what does this babbler say? He's a preacher, seems to be a preacher of foreign divinities. Why? Because it says Paul was preaching what? The good news of Jesus and his resurrection. You see, people might be able to question your facts. They might be able to question ideas. But brothers and sisters, The one thing, the one thing nobody can ever question is your testimony. The one thing nobody can ever question is the reality and the truth that Jesus Christ lived and died and was raised again and that he has come into your life to save you forever. Nobody can ever question that. And the one thing the Epicureans couldn't say and the one thing the Stoics couldn't say and the one thing that no religious person of that day could say or question was that Paul had a real life transforming experience because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And if you know Jesus Christ this morning, nobody could ever question or take away from you that Jesus has come into your life and through the resurrection changed your life forever. You see, Paul presented them the objective truth of Christianity plus his real life testimony and experience, the good news that Jesus was once dead but now alive and that he has rescued my life forever and ever. For our lost and dying world, oh, how do we need people to go out and say that this Jesus changed my life Not only was he real, not only did he live 2,000 years ago, but I know him and he knows me and he is the savior of my soul and the savior of my life and it's in him that I place my hope and my trust forever. You see, religion and philosophy can only present the facts. Religion and philosophy is all about explanation, but it's Christianity that proclaims a man who was once dead but now alive for you. And for me, religion and philosophy say, let me tell you about my truth. 
Christianity says, let me tell you who truth is. A man that lived and became the epitome of truth to set me free once and for all. Carl F. Henry, the great American theologian, said that the early church never said, look what the world is coming to. They went a step further and said, look what has come into the world. And brothers and sisters, we have the privilege every day to wake up and go out into our culture and go out into the marketplace and go out into the world and say, let me tell you about the one who has come to set you free and to make this world right. So it's important for us to understand where did he go. It's important for us to understand what exactly he did, presenting the objective truths of Christianity, but also proclaiming the resurrection and his testimony. And then lastly, why was he so effective? It begs the question, correct? 2,000 years later, we are still talking about the life and the ministry of the Apostle Paul. 2,000 years later, we are still talking about the stories of Christianity going from 12 to 120 to 3,000 to 120 and eventually taking this world and turning it upside down. What was so effective about the ministry of the early church, particularly the ministry of the Apostle Paul here? in Athens. Well, the answer is found in verse 16. In verse 16 of chapter 17, it says that Paul, while he was waiting for them in Athens, was walking around, and it says that he saw idols in the city. The government had set up idols, and the marketplace had set up idols, and even the religious leaders had set up idols. And what was his reaction? It says it right there in verse 16. It says that his spirit was provoked. What does that mean to be provoked? Well, the original language here for someone to be provoked, for Paul's spirit to be provoked means this. It means on the one hand that Paul was full of indignation and righteous anger, but to be provoked also meant to be full of compassion. What? It's an oxymoron. Indignation and anger on the one hand, but on the other hand, full of compassion But that is what it meant for your spirit to be provoked. And that is precisely what made Paul so effective in his ministry. He looked at the culture. He looked at the brokenness of the world. He looked at the death and darkness. And it filled him with anger. It filled him with indignation. But he looked at it at the same time. And he was full of compassion. You see, what we see here in the ministry of Paul is a ministry of tears a ministry of both righteous anger, but a ministry full of compassion. Where did Paul learn this? Where? He learned it from one place, the cross of Jesus Christ. You see, it is the cross of Jesus Christ at one moment in history shows us a God so full of indignation at the thought of sin But at the same time, the cross shows us a God so full of love and compassion that he is willing to pour that indignation out, not upon us, but his very own son. You see, if your ministry to a lost and dying world is not centered around the cross, you will never be effective as a missionary in our culture and in our day. It is the cross of Jesus Christ that centers us. On the one hand, if we are simply compassionate, we will not have the courage to stand up for the truth. But if we are simply indignant and full of anger, we will be written off as obnoxious and heartless. It is the cross of Jesus Christ that brings these two extremes together, unlike this world has ever seen. A God that is so full of indignation but at the same time a God that is full, so full of love and compassion. You and I need a cross. You and I need a cross to center our lives and we need a cross to center our ministry and our mission field to a lost and dying world. I said that Paul was on a missionary journey. What exactly moved this man to go out the Pharisee of Pharisees, as he called himself, to leave everything and to go on this missionary journey, even willing to sacrifice his life. It's the same thing that will move you. It's the story of Jesus going on the greatest and ultimate missionary journey of leaving the throne room of heaven and coming down and moving into your neighborhood, 
moving into your darkness, moving into your culture, moving into your brokenness. And when our hearts and minds are captured by Jesus who took the greatest missionary journey this world has ever seen for you, how can you not respond and say, yes, God, I will leave everything and go anywhere for the sake of your cause and the sake of your calling that you've placed on my life to go into the marketplace, to go into the culture, to go into the darkness and the brokenness of our world. Eugene Peterson, pastor and author, writes of a lady by the name of Judith. He says, Judith had an alcoholic husband and a drug addicted son. And so in order to keep her life and her family together for years, she would go with them to 12 step meetings. Nothing ever worked. But one Sunday, she was about 40 years old at the time, she entered the church where I was the pastor. She had never been to church before. She knew nothing about church. She was raised in a morally upright home but had no acquaintance with institutional or formalized religion. She never even read the Bible. If she had heard the stories in the Bible, she paid no attention to them. As far as she could recall, she had never even been inside a church. But something though caught her attention when she entered this church. And she continued to come. In just a few short months, she became a Christian and I became her pastor. I used to love observing and listening to her because everything was new. The scriptures, worship, prayer, baptism, even the Lord's Supper, it was all new to her. All her questions about God and Christianity were big exclamations. Where have I been all my life? These are incredible stories. How come nobody told me of these? How come this has been going on my whole life and I never knew? And the most indicting question of all, if this is all true, and if this is all truly so amazing, how come nobody introduced me to Jesus sooner? That's the question our culture is asking you this morning. How come, if it's so great, it's so amazing, and so glorious, and so life transformative, transforming. How come you never told me about this amazing story? Paul went on and he, at the end of chapter 17, it says that he continued to preach about Jesus and the resurrection. It says that some mocked, but some believed. And here this morning, I'm sure there are some people here when thinking about the resurrection and Christianity, you sit there and mock. But I have no doubt that there might be someone here today that's ready to believe. If this is all true, could it actually be true for you? And the good news this morning, because of Jesus and his perfect life and his death and his resurrection, he makes it so simple. Jesus says himself, if you believe in me, you'll never die, but have everlasting life. Would you run to the cross? The cross that says your sin had to be punished, but the same cross that said Jesus took the punishment for you. He loved us and he gave himself up for us. Now in return, we can go out and love and give ourselves up for a lost and dying world. Culture will say, religion's fine, keep it to yourself. But if this Christ is truly this amazing, May we never as a church keep it from anyone.